Thank you, worship team. Uh, boys and girls that are going to Children's Church, you are dismissed. I love the tune of that song. I think we've only sang it once or had it in here once, and I don't think I'd heard it anywhere else, and yet when Sam brought it up this week that he was going to look at it, I could recall it, um, but both through the, the tune of it, sticking to the brain and the repetition and the value of that. That makes uh, three drastically different from normal things that have happened musically in the life of our church in the last week or so. Last Sunday morning, I gathered with our Hispanic brothers and sisters for their monthly worship service in the fellowship hall. And when I'm just telling you, those of you that have not been up there with them, you need to get up there. You need to see and experience the way that they worship the Lord. And there was clapping. There's exuberance. So much so that as I'm clapping along and trying to process through the songs and working through it, that after about three or four minutes, my watch alerts me. And it says, it looks like you're doing a workout. Are you taking an ellipt? Are you working out on the elliptical? Okay. Listen. There's a place for your watch to notify you that it looks like you're doing a workout to praise Jesus, okay? There's a place for the value and the fun of what we had with the senior adults and some younger families being there on Monday for the gospel singing and watching the, the people enjoy the Lord and the songs of faith there as well. And for something like that, there are many ways for us to worship through song. And they should bring joy to our hearts and delight in our life. And you know what? If you don't like it, hey, don't do what a certain one-year-old did a minute ago and cry. Instead, wait for next week. So, Sam, I'm just letting you know that you, you did not bring joy to the life of a one-year-old in our congregation. They, they were not liking you and voicing their displeasure. Um, so, church, let's be a people who celebrate the Lord, recognizing and loving the diversity of the many ways that we can worship him. This morning, we're going to be in Romans chapter 15. We're going to finish out this kind of mini-series on working through our differences and loving one another. And today, we're going to look at the example of Christ. What you do impacts others. And from Romans 15, Christ is our example and hope. So, we'll go ahead and get that text onto the screen or... We'll get into it in just a second. If you're using the Pew Bible, it should be page 1128 in the Pew Bible. This will be our final week in this section. Let me, let me remind you that Paul here is talking largely, or talking about getting along on non-essentials of the faith. Getting along with each other, not by tolerating sin, but by having different preferences, and opinions. That's what he's talking about, okay? Now, within the church, we, we should have differences of opinions because God has wired us differently. God does not call upon us to be uniform, but to be united in Christ. We can and should be different, but united. You know, getting along with people you agree with on things is pretty easy, okay? For those of you that share of my truthful opinion that cats are wicked, it's easy for us to get along. Hey, if I've got to visit your house and you've got a cat, well, that's when we need Jesus to help us out, okay? Joking a little bit there, but listen, in our world, this is just bonus content because it's not, it's related to the text, but it's not really textual for a reason that's here, okay? Get along with people you agree with is pretty easy. Tolerating people you disagree with is a little more difficult. Okay? Tolerance requires having different opinions. The very definition of tolerance requires having different opinions and not the same. You don't have to tolerate somebody that has the same opinion as you. Okay? This is bonus content for in our world. And I say bonus because most of the discussion items where tolerance is required or requested in our culture are not the types of non-essential, non-sinful things that Paul is discussing in Romans 14 and 15. Okay? But just as a little note, tolerance requires not the same opinion, but different. And treating each other respectfully, kindly, lovingly, and graciously through those differences. So there's a bonus. 
because realistically, most of the time when our world uses those things, the, the request for tolerance, it is actually something that's not a preference issue, but would be something the Bible speaks clearly on. Okay? And we want to remember, Paul is not asking the church in Rome to tolerate sin, but to eradicate sin amongst believers. They should be living out right relationships with God and others, pursuing God's plan for their practical holiness by the power of the Spirit. Romans 15, 1 through 13. Follow along as I read. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him would the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And yes, boys and girls, that is a we- recent Awana verse. Okay. Saw the face, saw the reaction. All right, boys and girls, I have a warning for you today. I hope you brought your thinking cap. We're going a little bit advanced in the note-taking today. I'm going to make it harder for you than for the adults. Okay? I I think you can handle it. I'm pretty sure you've got it this week. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm only giving you what to draw in the first three boxes. Box number four, you have to come up with something from today's sermon... Not about cats or dogs to put in box four. And when you get your treat later from Mr. Stewart, he might want to know what you decided to put in box four. Okay? Might not ask all of you, but he might ask some of you, and it needs to be from the sermon. I'm only giving you the first three boxes. Box number four needs to be related to the sermon anything that you come up with related to the sermon, okay? I want you to do advanced note-taking today, okay? We good? Boys and girls, give me a thumbs up if you're good. All right, sideways thumb, maybe we'll see. All right, you guys have got this. All right, so when we get into the text, verse 1 and 2, they provide a good summary from the end of chapter 14 about the obligations of those that are strong to bear with and empower and build up those that are weak. He gives them an obligation, Though they might otherwise, the strong, feel free from obligations due to their Christian liberty, their liberty is to be governed by love. And liberty was to be focused on growing others rather than selfishly living out their freedom. Mature Christians are to take responsibility for helping others grow in Christ. So, in your notes, mature Christians walk with. They walk alongside. They don't leave behind. They walk with. And strengthen, not critique. They walk with, they strengthen immature believers. They don't isolate them. They don't ignore them. And they certainly don't insult them. And the church of Rome, this is what needed to happen. They needed to walk together instead of separate. Not isolating, not ignoring, certainly not insulting on non-essential issues. We ought to be a church family, mature believers walking with less mature believers. Boys and girls, box one. Remember, box four is the wild card. Box one, I want you to draw a strong person carrying a smaller person. 
Because it is in Christ that those who are strong and mature should be helping the weak, helping them grow, helping carry them, helping them walk. Box one, boys and girls, strong person carry in a smaller person. Paul calls upon them to build up the weaker ones, to limit their freedom for what is good for others. This doesn't mean they should never exercise their spiritual liberty in Christ, but that particularly in the presence of others, that they ought to be sensitive to the desires, the preferences, the needs of others to help them grow. As a church family, we need to walk with Jesus in the presence of each other. We need those strong in some areas to help those weak in those areas, and those strong in other areas to help them. Because the reality is, none of us are super, have arrived in every area. We need each other to help each other. Now, there is a pattern, and I would expect those that have been walking with Jesus for decades, devoting themselves to the things of God's Word, gathering together, pursuing holiness in practical ways to be more spiritually mature than a brand new believer. But I expect that because we all continue to require God's grace, that none of us are mature in every way and that we can all grow from each other in multiple ways. So when we see strong and weak here, we need to be thinking there's ways in which I'm strong, there's ways in which I'm weak. And where I'm weak, I can grow from others. Where I'm strong, I can help point others to God. As a church family, we learn from each other's strengths. We help each other in weaknesses. And we have an obligation to not make it more difficult than the Bible does to follow Christ. We don't need to be adding extra rules, and we have an obligation, I would say, to remove stumbling blocks or common hindrances to others and their growth. One way that we want to do that is recognizing that people have different ways in which they connect with others. I told somebody this week, like as an an introvert, I'm totally okay with talking to all of you from here. But if I have to come to your Sunday school class and talk with like 15 or 20 of you, oh, that becomes intimidating to me. I can talk to you right now because you don't talk back. Don't start talking back, please. Okay? If we got to have a conversation, that starts becoming a problem for me. I am wired in some ways that makes it easier for me to preach to you than sit with you and mingle with you. Some of you share or are even more introverted than me. So the concept of going to a Bible study class with 15 other people is really intimidating, and it's hard for some of you. That's where some smaller action groups and discipleship opportunities can come alongside. You do need others in your relationship with Jesus. We are not intended to walk alone in our relationship with Jesus. But the Bible does not say thou must go to Sunday school class with 20 other people. But it does say that we ought to be doing the one another's of Scripture. So in particular, recognizing schedules, recognizing some of you serve, there's opportunities to grow in connection with others outside of Sunday morning Bible study. Yes, I think most of you should be in Sunday morning Bible study. 80% of our people or more ought to be in Sunday morning Bible study. Those of you that can't or need other opportunities or do better in interacting with others ought to be involved in some of those other opportunities. There's Bible study opportunities throughout the week. Online, via Zoom, and in person for women, there's Wednesday night stuff, and you can kind of track along with that, being present with us. But also, men, one of the things that's been on the radar the last couple weeks is I'm trying to set up groups of two or three. Once we get to four, we probably will break into another group of men that can chat, that can talk, whether that's in person, whether it's via Zoom, once a month, once every other week, about the things of the Lord, push each other on to love and live for God in a smaller circle. Guys, today is your last day before I form those groups. Can I put you in one in a couple of weeks? Yeah, but it's going to be more difficult for me at that point. So this is your opportunity, men, or for women to pull out your your phone and email me and say, Pastor, I want in on one of those groups. Tomorrow, I'm going to form those groups, assign those groups, and chat with that. So right now is a good action time to take action and say, I need to be a part of that. I'm willing to be a part of that. Don't know what it looks like, I'll I'll work with you on the schedule, but today is the day. Pull out your phone, email me in the middle of service as an action step if that's a step that would help you grow in the things of the Lord. And that's ultimately what we ought to be doing. Trying to remove some, some hindrances here of scheduling. Trying to get 20 guys on a Tuesday at 11 a.m. is pretty hard. Trying to get two to three guys to coordinate schedule and talk about the things of the Lord is a lot easier. So trying to remove some hindrances You can talk to me after the service. If you don't want to email me, let me know today. You can get with me in the future, but it makes life more difficult. So 
Don't delay if you need to take that step. Not all of you do, but some of you probably do. Okay, ladies, stay involved in others' lives. Stay involved. And if you want to connect with others, let me know or let uh, Cindy Starkweather, the leader of our women's ministry, know, and she can help you connect with some others as well. Okay, verse 2 and 3. We wrap up verse 2. Verse 3, for Christ did not please himself. God's work, when we get to verse 3, God provides an example, and God empowers as well. God empowers believers, and God provides an example of service. Boys and girls, in box two, draw Jesus carrying someone. Okay, should be similar to box one. Maybe you already did Jesus as a strong guy, so you can draw it twice, or you can draw a different picture of Jesus. Okay, but Jesus is that strong, carrying. God, through Christ, carries and did not live selfishly, did not live for self-pleasure at the expense of others, but for God's glory, laying down his desires, consuming himself with the glory of God and the good of others, taking on the reproach and the shame of our sin, Christ in our place. The selflessness of Christ here is provided not just as a means of replacement for us and our substitute, but as an example. Often I do tell us as a church, we need to think more about what Jesus did, what did Jesus do, WDJD, than what would Jesus do. Okay? But in this text, Paul looks and says, what did Jesus do? Jesus is your example. Now, he's already gone through the gospel, Jesus in our place, all throughout Romans 4, 1 through 14. So this is not you save yourself by imitating Christ. This is you imitate Christ because you've trusted Christ as Savior and you're empowered by the Spirit, so you look to the example of Christ to be motivated and empowered to serve others. This is similar to that message of Philippians 2, 3, and 5. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. As Philippians 2, 5 says, it's in Christ that we can have this mindset. Christ is not only our example, God is the one that empowers us to live out the selfless life. We have seen the empowerment of the Spirit of God in Romans 6 through 8, how we are to be slaves and servants of God, not of sin. We're going to see later in verse 13 that God is the one that fills us with hope, joy, and peace through the Holy Spirit. So the big point that I want you to be noticing through here is that we don't manufacture our own motivation. I don't just look within and say, hmm, all right, I'm going to be really good at serving others. No, we look to the example of Jesus. We don't manufacture our own motivation, and we don't manufacture our own power. We receive the power to do this through God's Spirit and the power of God's Word. I love the way verse 4 and verse 5 go together back to back. Verse 4 talks about the Scripture. What was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. Verse 4 and 5 were reminded of the value of the Bible in helping us grow. Just as God gives us the Spirit to help us grow, He gives us the Bible to help us mature. Notice the, Paul, the things Paul says here, that the Bible helps us endure the things written in the past. He doesn't mean all historical documents help you grow, by the way. Okay? So this is not an open-ended, if it was written in the past, it's written for your good and encouragement and endurance. Okay, no, this is biblical. Old Testament is written to give us encouragement and endurance. How do we find encouragement to endure in the Old Testament? Well, if you're reading along with me and some others in the church, in the Bible reading plan printed in your bulletin, in the blue paper in the back, what you've seen over the last week or so of your reading, you've seen that Joseph, 
was doing something reasonably good, and he got put into a pit, sold into slavery, was doing well there despite his challenges, and then he got falsely accused for when he had done the right thing of doing the wrong thing. He went into prison, then he interprets a dream, and it's like, hey, get me out of here, dude, when you get out, and the guy forgets him, and everything is going bad for Joseph in Genesis 37 through about 42. Things are going terribly. It seems like he's forgotten by God, forgotten by others. And then God turns the story around and he says what you intended for evil, God intended for good, for the saving of many nations. So what does, what, how, how from Genesis 37 through 50 do we find encouragement and endurance? We find encouragement and endurance from God's faithfulness to Joseph to write the end of his story in a way that honors God and is for Joseph's good, recognizing God sees all and knows all. We recognize endurance by recognizing that when God spoke to Abraham about giving him a son, that he did not do so immediately, and yet Abraham, through his on-again, off-again obedience, his bad decisions, God honored God's promises, even though it took God 25 years. Could God have made something happen a lot faster than that? God spoke a world into existence. He certainly could have. And yet we see sometimes God promises and says something, and yet it takes 25 years. We see that through Moses, 40 years growing up in Egypt, 40 years wandering in the wilderness, 40 years leading people out. Sometimes God's timeline is not our timeline. We see endurance in the people that walk with God, and we find encouragement to endure as we read the examples of the Old Testament and God's faithfulness to them even when they're not always faithful in return. We find encouragement to endure. We find God's patience with his people reminding us to be patient with people. As God has treated others, we ought to treat uh, treat us with patience and others with patience, we ought to be patient as well. We get to verse 5. Paul begins to pray, may the God, it's a prayerful phrase, may the God of endurance and encouragement It's through the scriptures that there's endurance and encouragement, and now it's the God of endurance and encouragement. Why? Because the scriptures are God's word. Okay, there's not this one thing, God God is this and the scriptures are different. No, the scriptures reliably point us to God. The God of endurance and encouragement, who gives us endurance and encouragement through the scriptures and through the spirit, may he grant us to live in harmony with one another. So what we find here at the end of verse 5 is a prayerful phrase. He doesn't see reading the Bible as automatically bestowing upon us endurance and encouragement. Instead, he sees this close-linked relationship between Bible intake and prayer for God to accomplish his purpose in us through our scripture intake. So that means that we should read the Bible carefully, and we should read the Bible prayerfully. When you find something in the Bible, God, help me to understand this, help me to know what it's saying, God, by your grace, help me to live it. Read the Bible carefully and prayerfully. Not just saying that, hey, as I read through these words on the page, they're automatically going to work. No, God, work in me according to your purpose in the pages of Scripture that I might, by the power of the Spirit, be filled with joy and peace and hope in believing that I might abound by the Spirit's power and hope. God, do what you say you want to do in me. And in others. Verse 6 and 7. Boys and girls, I haven't forgot about you. We've got another page before I get to your box 3. Okay? When we get to verse 6 and 7, we have a reminder that our unity glorifies God. We should be welcoming one another as Christ has welcomed us. If God can welcome us into his family, then we should welcome one another as siblings. As a reminder, Jesus had told the disciples they were to be known, and the song that we were singing, singing was from God, Christ's prayer for his disciples to be known by their unity and their love for one another, not their uniformity. In our differences, we are to glorify God by keeping the main thing the main thing. Church, as your pastor and part of your pastoral staff for nine and a half years now, I'm thankful that we normally do a pretty good job keeping the main thing the main thing keeping our focus on the Lord and growing in Him. Somebody recently asked me what my vision and what I felt like God was calling our church to over this year. And the first thing that came to my mind is to be faithfully in His Word, living it out. And then I thought, what's the greatest danger to that? Well, the greatest danger to that is that we become focused on non-essential matters. 
and that some of us decide that our opinions are more important than the opinions of others. And that we need to be a, a church that dis discusses and debates opinions and preferences. I've been praying that we can all let go of personal preferences and align together as a church body, working on the things God has for our future instead of trying to get our own way. The task of the maturing Christian is not to be a disruptor that has to get their way. Instead, it's to come alongside others, living in harmony, laying down non-essentials that others might grow and that the body might be united to glorify God with one voice. The task of the mature Christian is to say, my preferences don't matter as much as my desire to see others glorify God. It is to be a unifier, not a disruptor. It's to say, we exist to glorify God. And if this is just my preference and it isn't an essential matter, then I'll lay down my preference to help others glorify God. That's to be the task of a maturing Christian. That should be the mindset of the strong. The mindset of the weak is the opposite. It has to be about me, me, me. Romans 14 and 15 say to us, let's consider our impact on others. Let's honor God and help others grow in Him. Let's be unifiers, glorifying God on non-essential matters. I want to be very clear. There are things that the Bible calls sin, and we must hold to what the Bible calls sin as sin. But a lot of things just resolve and flow down to preference matters. And there's a place to discuss them. There's a place to be different on them. But there's a place to lay down our differences and unite behind Make us one, 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 living in the task of your love and showing that love to others with one voice, glorifying God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has welcomed us so we ought to welcome one another. Paul's demonstrated this mentality of laying aside his personal preference to glorify God. He told the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, For though I am free from all, I've made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I'm not myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Let's be a people that lay down our preferences and unite around the task of glorifying God and making him known to the neighborhoods and nations and growing as a family and building each other up. We get to verses 8 through 12. We're reminded again of the work of Christ to unite and save all different types of people. And God's salvation unites all types of people. Boys and girls, box three. I know this is really similar to last week. I am Paul saying something similar here. So I'm saying something similar here. Draw in box three all different types of either people, or I'm okay with you doing animals. If you do animals, you can do dogs and cats. You, you can do like lions and the antelope getting along in Jesus. Okay? All right? God's salvation unites all types of people. I need you to draw for me all different types of people or different types of animals in the same church. Because that is what Paul keeps going back to. That's why we're going back to it. What we have in common in Jesus is more important than anything we have different. In verse 8, he talks about Christ coming to the circumcised to show God's truth, to confirm the promises to the patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Okay? And in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. He contrasts the Jews and the Gentiles and he reminds them of the theology he'd expounded on in chapter 11. Saying that Jesus' life and ministry were not what everyone had expected. But it was the perfect fulfillment of God's promises to the patriarchs. And as we read this week, if you're reading along with me in Exodus, what you're going to see and what I want you to think about is how Christ is the true and perfect fulfillment of that Passover lamb sacrificed for us that we might be spared the wrath of God for the death that we deserve. I want you to read through how he is that sacrifice that takes away our sin when we walk through the Exodus account. How we deserve to die for breaking God's law and yet how Christ died for us 
for our breaking of God's law when he was the perfect and sinless, spotless one in our place. As we read through the sacrificial system, notice Christ, the fulfillment for us. Jesus was the fulfillment of the plan that began with Abraham, that of his seed that the nations might be blessed. It was for the sake of the world that God sent Christ through Abraham and his descendants. And Paul gives a final string of quotations from the Old Testament. He's been doing that throughout Romans. This is the last string of them. There's one that comes up in another text in a future week. But this is the last string. And here he quotes from the Old Testament numerous times. He quotes from the Torah or the law, the three major divisions of the Jewish Old Testament, showing basically, hey, it's throughout. He goes with the Torah and the law. He goes with the prophets and the writing. And he, he moves in this progression, and it's a sequence from praising God amongst the Gentiles to all people praising God, recognizing Christ as the Messiah and placing their hope in him, even the Gentiles doing so. All right, why does Paul come back to this here? I think the reason Paul comes back to this, having just come out of this discussion about in one voice glorifying God, is reminding them that in their culture, there were Jews and not Jews. And if you were a Jew, you knew who the not Jews were. And if you were not a Jew, you knew who the Jews were. They were diametrically opposed in so many ways. And Paul looks at him and says, let me remind you, what you've got in common in the Savior is way more important than your background. You're to be united in Christ. And that Holy Spirit, he prays by the power of the Spirit that they would abound in hope, joy, and peace. Walking by the power of the Spirit instead of according to the things of the flesh. Walking by the Spirit in unity for God's glory, that with one voice we would glorify God, walking in the bond of love. They are to be reminded of God's perfect fulfillment of his promises to the patriarchs that involve the salvation of all types of people and be unified, therefore, in non-essentials. When we're growing in Christ, when we're manifesting the Spirit's hope, joy, and peace, it's unlikely that we're simultaneously arguing with one another. It's unlikely that we're manifesting love, joy, hope, peace, and kindness, the fruit of the Spirit, that we're also arguing with others. I want you to notice here that pettiness and divisiveness are not the fruit of the Spirit. There's a lot of things that are the fruit of the Spirit. And coming out of this text on unity, he gives them love, joy, and peace, which, and hope, which reminds me a lot of the fruit of the Spirit. Let's go to the fruit of the Spirit. It's not a coconut. Okay? It's not any other number of fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I didn't find pettiness or divisiveness there. We are being governed by the Spirit. We manifest things that are good for the unity of God's people. That with one voice, we might glorify God. That with one voice, we might say my preferences are not as important as others growing in Jesus. Yes, we deal with sin. We deal with sin. We treat each other according to God's grace, pointing out sin and calling us to live a life of holiness. But in non-essentials, we say, God, it's not about me and my preferences. How can I help my brother grow? I love working with Pastor Ron. Just about every Sunday morning that I walk into his office or he'll walk into my office and he asks me this question, is there anything you need help with today? I love that some of you show up at church with your boots on to work and to serve. That is the type of mentality we ought to have when we gather together. What can I do to help, to serve, to encourage others in the things of the Lord? As God has treated us in Christ, we are to treat others by laying down our preferences that others might grow. We are to be united in a bond of love that we receive from God that we might reflect to one another. Let's walk in the things of the Lord, not the things of the flesh, 
Let's ask God to unify us, to grow us, that we might with one voice glorify God, that others might know and grow Him, and that we might celebrate as a family the way that God unites us from different backgrounds, different preferences for worship, different styles, different generations united in Christ, celebrating Him and the bond of love. I'll be available in the back if you want to, but we'll to talk. But let's rise now, stand and sing.